The views and opinions expressed on Unlock Your Wealth Radio are those of the host, guests, and callers only and are not necessarily the views of Unlock Your Wealth Radio, Heather Wagonalls, or Success Publishing International. More willpower than a barefoot woman at a shoe sale. Able to stretch a single paycheck for an entire month. Makes money concepts easier than third grade math. Introducing your purveyor of prosperity, Heather Wagonall. Work all day, stress all night. Take your mind off your money and focus on your life. Money don't matter for the stuff it bought. It's the way you think, not what you've got, yeah. Unlock Your Wealth Radio starts now. Yes, indeed. Get your money mind right here. Heather Wagon Hall's here, your purveyor of prosperity. And I am flanked by the maestro of Mula Michael Terry. Hey, folks. And we are going to help you get your money mind right on today's show with the following. First, we have a key and we have part two of our fabulous interview with real estate attorney Scott Rydenbach today. So we don't have much time. We need to jump in. We try to preserve as much of the content that we could for you. We're skipping moolah word of the day, and then we're going to head right into the key. But first, a special gift for you, radio listeners of Unlock Your Wealth Radio. Audible.com wants you to become a voracious reader, our 13th key, and they are going to help you do that by giving a free book to Unlock Your Wealth Radio listeners. All you have to do is visit the website at audibletrial.com forward slash unlock your wealth and click on the link to over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Maestro? Uh, The key. You're looking for the key. I am. Uh, forget the perfection principle. Say that, yes. say that three times. <laughs> FTPP. That's what I had just there abbreviated. FTPP, baby. Yes, today, forget the perfection principle. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to Unlock Your Wealth Radio. I'm so glad you stopped by. Our Keys to Riches is my financial philosophy that teaches you how to think like the rich and be in control of your own money. It also gives you specific techniques to create or fix your credit, eliminate debt, save and invest, all while transforming your current financial habits into health money management skills. We do this one key at a time, one week at a time here at Unlock Your Wealth Radio. All you have to do is visit the website at unlockyourwealthradio.com or go visit our Facebook fan page because that's where we do Unlock Your Wealth Live and we feature the key of the week. And so on Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific, you too can join us and be a part of the conversation at facebook.com forward slash unlock your wealth radio. And if you participate in the show live, well, guess what? You can have your questions answered. I'm right there. Nice. And I'll beam you into the show and I'll answer your questions on whatever the key is or whatever your other financial questions are. As you are in pursuit of financial freedom, I'm here to be your guide. Uh, we've got, we are on the heels of National Financial Literacy Month, and I'm so excited. I just, you know, landed another opportunity to speak for National Financial nice. Literacy Month at this women's organization right. on April 3rd, Tuesday, April 3rd at West Valley Women. But I'd love to invite you all. It's the annual hat luncheon, as well as we're kicking off Financial Literacy Month with my girlfriend, Lisa Platt, and the West wow. Valley Women. We're going to be wearing some hats. It's a, it's a hat contest, so you better have a fabulous chapeau. Nice. But let's get started, shall we? I'm so thrilled to bring to you the second half of our Facebook Live interview with Scott Rydenbach. Join me as we reprise this interview right in the middle of the action. Well, yeah, I mean, we always, whether it's cars or houses or just, you know, crap at the store, we buy on emotion and use reason and logic to justify our decisions after the fact. We we figure out a way to to make it make sense for us. And then, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, about 10 years ago, you know, when I started um, really defining my real estate practice, I said, I only want to work with investors. And one of the biggest hurdles was when, you know, you would take and find a property that met their financial criteria to accomplish the 
their personal goals, which I'd want them to be emotional about, hey, let's buy a property now. And, and you know, in five, 10 years, you'll not only have income, but you'll have hopefully capital appreciation that'll help you pay for your kid's college. And those are the emotional hot buttons I want to be pushing to get them to say yes. But then you show them the property and they're like, I don't know about that lime green shag. <laughs> and you're like, it doesn't matter. You're not living here, but they get engaged. It's so funny that you bring up the emotion part of it because they do, they get engaged in the wrong part of it. <laughs> they should be excited right. and engaged in the money part of it because there's no point in doing it I know. if it's not going to be profitable. But now I'm talking crazy logic stuff. I know that. Well, I know. But hey, listen, most most successful investors are very, you know, very dispassionate. They're they're about the numbers because listen, more often than not, it doesn't make sense to invest in real estate in in a lot of situations because you're you're making that emotional decision or that 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 um you know that that spur of the moment decision. But the smart people, you know, really crunch the numbers and make it, you know, as unemotional as possible. But that's not your average um, investor in real estate. I see more of the opposite. Yeah, well, you know, one of my keys and my keys to riches financial philosophy is take emotion out of the picture. And it's not about eliminating emotion, but but be, you know, passionate and excited, but keep them in perspective. You know, you want to be excited about the prospects of generating money and not just for the sake of money, but for what it's going to do for you. You know, it's going to help create a retirement plan for you. It's going to help create college income, you know, to help support your children or whatever. You know, so, so we, I try to keep them excited, but I try to channel it in the right directions. And so when someone comes to me and they say, I want to get started in real estate, I heard you're the go-to girl, but I have like $5,000. I don't have that much to get started, but I really want to get started. And so we talk about, okay, so do you have friends or other people that might be interested, that might be able to match funds with you, that may want to invest with you? And they say, uh, well, I don't know. Do we take on partners to get started? And if so, what do we want to look for when qualifying a partner to begin real estate investing with? Right. I almost always discourage people from having investors and partners in, in real estate, unless it's a large commercial transaction, which is a, you know, a multi-million dollar endeavor. Because you're right, a lot of people come to us and say, hey, I'm, me and my, my friend or my roommates and I or my, my, my sister and I want to buy a property at, at the shore or in downtown Philadelphia. And I mean, Heather, here are the challenges. And, and I think you know this, but just for your, your listeners and viewers, if you buy a property with other people, you're not always in, in lockstep at the same time in year one, in year two, in year three, because someone's financial situation is going to change and they want out. Um, or they want to have more of a say in how things are being handled or, or improvements to the house that should be made or should not be made, it's, it's hard. It's like a marriage. It's, it's a really hard relationship. <laughs> and you're now, you're, now combining, you're now combining money with an investment with friends, and that's, that's a tough recipe uh, to manage all three of them successfully at all times. So you know, if you really need the money to make this thing work, I'd, I'd rather just have someone get a loan and, and borrow the money, but not take on partners and investors. Yeah, I, I've seen it go wrong more than I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, 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 no, you're right. Cause it, cause it, it will go sideways, you know, and, you know, and, and I have a, a pretty like strict checklist, if you will, um, to vet potential investors. And, you know, that's where I'll shake them out right away. And I'll say, look, you've got great credit, you have assets, and you have good reasons. You're wanting to take on a partner because they're liquid for cash, but they have crappy credit and they have challenges. You know, maybe they have they have more than just crappy credit. Maybe they have defaults or judgments against them. You know, what are depending on how you title the property, you might have you know clouds on your title if you do tenants in common. And then, you know, I mean, depending on how you set up the structure, do you put it in an LLC? There's so many different ways, as you know, to take title and to structure entities. How do you deal with people that, you know, you, they see the green and they don't look at the rest and, 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 and you've got people with, with credit issues or bad business issues that are haunting them? 
and people are, you know, heading for the cash. They're focused on the cash. How, how do you reconcile that yeah. with the individual? So I, I think it's it's no different than assembling a any any work team or business team. I mean, if you if you have a group of people that want to invest in real estate, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. And, and I think being very clear with who brings what to the table and 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 the role that they're going to play in that partnership is, is critical because. You're right. Ideally, you have your money person that has just gives money and doesn't say a word. They stay out of the, you know, let's say the day-to-day operations of the business. You have someone who's the managing member of the of the LLC. They're actually doing, you know, filling out the the lease forms, you know, um, obtaining uh, rent payments, putting them in the bank account. So if those roles are clear and defined, that's a much better uh, relationship and recipe than when everyone just you know wants to be very very involved. And, and you're right. Some people are better with money than others, right? And, and other people are more creative than others, and others are more um, organized than others. So, if you're going to bring on investors and partners, have very clear roles in, in who's going to do what. That, that avoids a lot of the problems down down the road. Okay. So let's say you've done that. You've taken the time to establish roles and responsibilities and you start moving forward on the project. And let's say the money partner like encounters some other financial troubles and can't keep giving the money. Or maybe one of the people that put up base money but said, I can't, you know, I don't want to be involved in the day-to-day activities. Let's say they, they're beset with a financial crisis and they need to get out of this transaction. They're, you know, you impressed upon them that this is not a liquid investment. It takes too long to get in and out of, and you got to keep your shorts on. But some people, you know, they make ineffective decisions in a crisis and somebody says, okay, I want out. How do you handle that person once you've already begun, but you're not complete with whatever you were doing and whether it's a fix and flip or, you know, a, a, a rehab to hold. What do you do in that situation when you've got a squirrely partner? Yeah, which which happens very often. So the the first option is you can buy them out. You can literally buy out their share. Um, you know, repay them their capital investment and any earnings percentages that they've you've all agreed upon as as partners or members of the LLC. But if you if you can't afford to do that, meaning you don't the other partners don't have enough liquidity, um, they have to keep paying the mortgage. They have to keep paying the you know the the, the taxes and the insurance. So oftentimes we see this, we have, you know, let's say three people involved in a, in a venture. Uh, one flakes out and, and can't, can't keep paying. The other two can't afford to buy that third person out. So the other two pick up the slack, pay, pay more, you know, pay a higher share of the, the ongoing expenses, and they either refinance the property and pull out some cash, or when they sell the property down the road, they kind of just square it up and settle up with that third person on the back end. But all the while, until that point, they're they're you know, bearing the burden of the increased you know, monthly payments and, and expenses, and you know that ruins a lot of friendships between partners. Oh yeah, I mean I've seen it happen, unfortunately, and you know to this day, you know fifteen twenty years down the road, they're still not speaking to each other. So let's say that whether you have a partner or not, you have found a property, it's, you know, you've addressed any HOA issues, like you can't park on the, you know, curb or street at night, or you can't have overnight guests in the, in the guest parking, you have all these other issues, but then, you know, you're trying to, you know, either whatever you're doing, whether it's a a fix and flip or a rehab and hold, and now you're running into some legal challenges with the city and you're dealing with zoning or ordinances. Uh, is this something that people should be keeping on their radar when they're investing? Should they investigate what zoning ordinances are out there first, or is it something that's easily handled? Yeah, that's a great question. And that happens a lot, you know, more, more in the cities and ur- urban environments than out in the suburbs. But um, yes, I mean, with anything, do your homework and perform your due diligence and find out whether you can, for example, can students live in the property? You know, can it be more than three unrelated persons in a property? Yes, yes or no. Um, and in Philadelphia, also, what, what uses can be done in the property and what can't be done? So a great example is somebody buys a, a condo, I'll go back to a condo for a minute, and they rent it out to a tenant who is conducting uh, a business of some kind out of the unit. 
And you know, lo and behold, that's not allowed in most planned communities. They can't run a business, you know, see clients, have have vehicle traffic coming in and out, um, run the business at 10 o'clock PM. So if you don't know that going in, that, that's a huge problem because you now have a land a tenant who can't use the property. Um, they stop paying the rent because they can't use the property or they're being harassed by the property manager or the board of directors. Um, or that they're in a city environment and they want to put a rooftop deck on or, or remodel the property and they can't do that because of local you know, zoning ordinances or other statutes. And it really decreases the value of the property or the intended use of the property and it ends up being a bad investment. So Yes, home, homework and due diligence uh, prevent a lot of that from happening. Yeah, I've seen how some condo HOAs are now amending their rules to um, limit or totally prohibit um, Airbnb as as one of the options. You know, um, you can't do short term or nightly or weekly leases, and and that's what I've seen here that's been changing because of the dynamic of this incredible income generating industry disruptor. You know, and and. And I know that the small suburb town that I live in, they're contemplating on, you know, starting to tax homeowners and they're trying to figure out a way to yeah. tax homeowners mm-hmm. a bed tax, you know, that's not yes. being collected because it's considered, you know, a hotel or whatever. So um, it's always interesting how the government likes to get involved in things like that. So let's say you've rehabbed your property and you're a rehab and hold person. And what are some of the, you know, common or maybe not so common, but prolific uh, landlord tenant issues that we have to be aware of before we start making, you know, um, investment decisions. What are some considerations as a management or a property manager should you be paying attention to? Yeah. Wow. Boy, where do I start with that one? Um, (laughs) That's a big one. That's probably a whole (laughs) separate show, but. That could be, that could be a whole, a whole uh, week long program. But I, I think, I mean, listen, for your audience, num- number one is getting getting paid. So getting getting paid the rent is is paramount, right? You have to get paid your monthly rent. Um, so one thing that I've seen happen, which is extraordinary, is some some landlords require tenants to give them the monthly rent checks dated and signed for the entire year for twelve months, and the, like almost like an escrow situation, the landlord holds those checks and deposits them on the first or fifth or 10th of the month as appropriate. So that's one, that's one way to, you know, either avoid having a payment problem or to really see how, um, you know, how outstanding your tenant is is to get those prepaid checks. Mm -hmm. But that's unusual. You rarely see that happening. Yeah. And I think you can only have, um, one and a half time. You can only, um, require one and a half times here in Arizona per our landlord tenant laws. Right. For, for deposit, you're, you're absolutely correct. But so these are more, the landlord would actually hold the checks, it, literally put them in your drawer and not deposit them until they're due the first, the 10th of the month, you know, per, per the lease. Mm-hmm. Um, so payment issues are a huge thing. And you know, we handle a lot of collections for landlords where tenants just don't pay. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I think what's happening, and this is no disrespect to the millennials out there, but a lot of the younger tenants they don't quite understand or, or appreciate that some things, sometimes, sometimes things break and sometimes, you know, knobs fall off and doors don't close and that, that kind of, that happens in a property, but they're, they're getting more and more demanding of the landlord to fix everything you know, right away. It's the Amazon prime mindset. <laughs> um, or if, if they don't, if they don't fix it right away, they withhold their rent. So we have, you know, our landlord clients who, Maybe the dishwasher broke for four days or five days. The tenant will withhold rent for those five days or try to prorate the rent accordingly because they're not satisfied. They didn't get the full value of the property for those four or five days. That happens more and more, um, we're seeing. And and just general upkeep and behavior. You know, it gets it, being a landlord is, is not is not glamorous. Um, yeah. I'll put it mildly. Um, even when you do a background check and, and get a credit score and call references, there's no guarantee because people, people change situations yes, change. Yes, they do. Um, so, you know, I think one, this might sound old fashioned, but as a landlord, if you can develop a relationship, uh, or rapport with your tenant, 
that goes a long way to iron out a lot of the, the silly things that happen. It's when you're an absentee landlord or you use a management company and there is literally no relationship. It's us against them or me against them, mm -hmm. that, that dichotomy. That's when things go sideways pretty quickly. Yeah, it's difficult to, to manage and control a relationship if you're not connected to it. You know, other than from a legal perspective. So I, th I think that's great advice. You are listening to Scott riding back on Unlock Your Wealth Radio and Unlock Your Wealth Live here on our Facebook fan page. Um, so a lot of people, they think about real estate as a potential retirement uh, vehicle. Some people think about, you know, maybe it's a great way to, to save and build wealth so I can send my kid to college someday. Or if I buy in a college town where I think my kid's going to go, then they can live there back then. But we always think about how we're going to get into a property. But why is it important to have an exit strategy? Well, it's, it's like, boy, it's like anything. Um, you have to know kind of where you're headed and, and where 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 it's going to stop because, you know, with some properties, and, and I, I understand this personally as well. Plans change, <laughs> so you buy a property and the, the economy you know tanks. You you buy a property and and you know rates go up. Um, but I think you know every two or three years you own a property, just like if you have a you know a will or a living will. You have to review that plan, review that document, and see where you are at that period of time, because yeah, things change. Um, I think again, if you're looking to get a short-term profit, that's a whole different play and different analysis versus you know the long-term hold. But the great thing about real estate is, is what you can always sell it, right? You can always get out of get out of the property. I mean, maybe at a loss, but you can always get out of the of the, the property if you need to. Um, and if you buy the right property, even if you plan to occupy it yourself, if things change, you can then rent the property out. Um, you know, you can sell it, you can rent it, um, you can use it yourself. So it's, it's, it's a great piece to have in any portfolio, but you should have a plan, some kind of plan when you go in, but the plan can be flexible and change as, as the conditions change. Yeah, I, I, I like that. You know, one of the things that that I have found when people, you know, they get into a property and maybe they're just overwhelmed with it. You know, if you buy your property right, regardless of what the market is doing, if you have a seasoned tenant, let's say, you know, let's say rates go through the roof and people can't afford to buy. Somebody can always afford to buy. And if you have a seasoned tenant that is paying, you know, you might not be able to sell that to an owner occupant, but that property with a seasoned tenant may be even more than market value to an investor who might be willing to pay a premium to have a property with a seasoned tenant that he doesn't have to go in and fix. So, you know, they, every, you know, investor, they, especially if they, they need or they're looking for the deals and then they have to rehab it and then still find a tenant, they've got that reserve in their mind that they're going to spend to rehab the property and then advertise and promote to find the tenant. And instead of doing that, if you have a property already, I mean, and you need to get out, that's a really great way to do that because, you know, you transfer the rental agreement so your client is protected and you may make out better than what you'd have done if, if you would have waited or tried to sell it to somebody else and and all that other nonsense. So I think that having an ex exit strategy, but also understanding that there's a value in plan B if you buy it right that you can still get ahead. Is that, would you say that's a reasonable assumption? Very, very, very much so. And, and, and as a, as an investor, if you're looking to buy a property, let's, let's say you're buying a, you know, a multifamily or, or a duplex that has two, three or four uh, tenants in there. Uh, yes. The, 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 the rental roster and the payment history of those tenants is very important. Um, but I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount the value sometimes Heather of keeping the tenant in place because you know, every every year, and we see this happen. The landlords want to raise the rents, right? You know, five percent, ten percent, and sometimes you have a really good tenant in your property, your building, that they can't afford that increase. But bear in mind to have them move out, uh, move out unhappy because they, the rent got raised, so they're unhappy, unhappily moving out. The property gets a little trashed or beat up on their way out because they're upset. You have to advertise the property fix the property, 
you know, pay a realtor or a management company to get a new tenant, you're often better off just not raising that rent for that that one more year. I mean, if you do the math on that, it's pretty darn close to just keeping that tenant in place at last year's rate versus all the things I just described. Well, and I think that that probably makes it easier if it plays back into what you said earlier about creating a relationship with your tenant. Yes, yes, because if you if you work with them and and, and tackle the problem together, that that might go a long way. It's, it's when the the landlord just keeps you know, raising the rent and saying you know pay it or you know pay it or else you're out. That creates a lot of uh, discord between landlords and tenants. So you know th- we've just scratched the surface and we've talked quite a bit today about the ins and out of real estate investment. I just pinned your real estate uh, or your your law website, rideandbacklaw.com. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, thank oh, you. Okay, good. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, so, right, yeah, Rydenbach right 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 Law. Okay, so Rydenbacklaw.com, I have it posted in the comments. But if folks want, like, um, what would be the value in seeking out a real estate attorney before they begin the investment process? How can that add value to what they plan to do and make it more successful? Yeah, great question. So oftentimes we have clients that want to invest in in locations that aren't in their backyard. So for example, we have clients here in Philadelphia that want to buy property in, for example, Salt Lake City, Utah. And they they've been there, they 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 like it, they they found the property, but they don't know they don't know the whole the first thing about the process, whether you know, do we form an LLC? Um, you know, should we be partners or um, you know, what legal structure should we have to buy the property? And then beyond that, I mean, to be honest, Heather, a, a good realtor or property manager can do a lot of the legwork for an investor. Um, I think an attorney brings value by identifying and smoking out the ordinance and, and the use or, or zoning issues with the property. Um, if it's in a planned community, especially having an attorney who does condo HOA like, like our firm does, just read over the governing documents, the declaration and the bylaws. Uh, rules and regulations and making sure you can have a tenant, you know, is there a minimum lease term of 12 months or otherwise? Um, so just advising and informing the landlord about what they're buying. But beyond Two pets, that, both under 20 okay. pounds a piece. <laughs> Those are some of the silly exactly, things I've seen. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, you know, no boats parked in the front lawn, all, all those fun things. Um, but honestly, a good realtor can, can take it from there as far as, you know, making the offer on the property, you know, conducting the closing. Um, and then the landlord can help. I'm sorry, the realtor can help out with the lease as well. You know, leases are, are standard forms. You don't need a, a lawyer for a lease. But I think when things go sideways and someone's not paying you or they're, they're trashing the property or conducting something illegal within the property, that's when you turn to a real estate attorney to, to help out. Mm -hmm. Well, if folks are in Pennsylvania or thinking about investing in Pennsylvania, how do they get a hold of you? Our our website is a great stopping point. Again, it's ridenbachlaw.com. And from there, they can view all of our attorney profiles and contact us directly. And um, we have a lot of clients who invest all across the country. Uh, I just gave a reference of a property in Utah. We do properties in, in New Jersey, the Jersey Shore. Uh, Florida and and beyond. So uh, we can easily troubleshoot or answer questions for any investor that wants to buy anywhere in the country. Outstanding. Well, thanks so much for being a part of Unlock Your Wealth today. And are there any parting thoughts you might have for those who've stopped by to give the show a listen? You know, I I do, actually. I I clearly, I love real estate. I'm very passionate about it. I think it's a a great thing to add to your portfolio. And as I mentioned, if it doesn't go well, you can always get out and, and always sell, but um, if you find the right property and, and go with the right mindset, it's um, it can be very rewarding and very profitable. Outstanding. Well, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. And for those of you listening in radio land, never fear, unlockyourwealthradio.com is here. So if you're driving around without a pencil, you can visit his show page and get Scott's linky links to his website and so much more. For the maestro of moolah back there, Michael Terry. I'm Heather Wagonhalls. Now go out and unlock your wealth today. 
UnlockYourWealthRadio.com is produced by Heather Wagonhalls and the Unlock Your Wealth Foundation. UnlockYourWealthRadio.com and its affiliates are copyrighted 2018 with all rights reserved. For more information on the Keys to Riches Financial Wellness Series, please visit our website at www.unlockyourwealth.com.